joining me from the north is Victoria O'Neill from the Long Island Sound Study. She's the New York Habitat Restoration and Stewardship Coordinator, and she's with New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, from the south, we have the folks from CTUC. So we have Ariel Santos, my co-conspirator in this community science Long Island webinar series. She's the policy program coordinator for CTUC. We have Emily Hall, the conservation policy advocate. And we have Enrico Nardone, the uh, executive director of CTUC. And from the east end, we have the folks from the Peconic Estuary Partnership. We have Lauren Shear, who's the education and outreach coordinator. We have Elizabeth Hornstein, uh, this, the state coordinator and environmental analyst, and uh, Sarah Schaefer, the program coordinator and another environmental analyst for the Peconic Estuary Partnership. So um, before I hand it over to our panelists, um, I just wanted to go over two things. One is that uh, the format of this webinar is a little bit different than um, some others you might have attended. Um, and that is because of the different regions that we have here today. So we're gonna kick things off pretty normally. Uh, Vicky is gonna go over the ecology of a river herring and American eel and some of the management efforts going on in Long Island. Then Emily's gonna give us a little bit of an intro into the survey tool that's used in our uh, monitoring. And then we're going to break out into three uh, mini presentations in, as breakout groups. We'll have one north, one south, and one east. So when you registered, you had the chance to, to choose. Um, but if you didn't, um, after Emily, you'll have the chance to let me know which one you would like to be sorted in. And I know we have people here from Connecticut today and from other regions. So um, feel free to choose whichever one you like, whichever one you're curious about. Um, and you'll have the regional leads talk a little bit more regionally about the local streams and rivers that require monitoring in those different places. Um, the other thing I wanted to say just before I hand it over is just some housekeeping. Number one is that you'll notice this is being recorded and uh, the breakout groups will also be recorded and the video, at least for the main session, will be available online. Um, number two is that you'll notice you're all, you're muted. all muted. We ask that you please keep it that way. Uh, to do out of respect to the presenters. But if you have any questions throughout the presentations, absolutely, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, as you've seen, we have, we have a bunch of experts with us today. So they'll be uh, behind the scenes answering questions in the chat. Um, and the last thing I'll say is just a heads up that um, as you registered with your email, you're automat you were automatically um, added to a listserv to receive information about our river herring survey. Uh, if you want to unsubscribe, you absolutely can, but we just wanted to give you a heads up. Um, and also to let you know that uh, there is a Facebook group um, for the survey. So if you wanna receive information about it through there, you can also do that. And I'll put that in the chat. There we go. All right, and so with that, I'll hand it over to you, Vicki. Okay, here we go. Hopefully everybody can see this. Good? Okay. Okay, well, great. Thanks for joining us, everybody, today. Um, it's exciting to see so many people um, interested in uh, river herring and eels here on Long Island. So to get started, um, we're going to talk a little bit of um, some definitions. So we're going to talk a lot about diadromous fish, and that's that's the fish that we're going to uh, learn about today. And diadromous broken down just means across running or through running. So these are fish that move between different bodies of water. So fish that are moving between fresh water bodies, so rivers and streams, um, and saltwater, ocean. There are two types of di diadromous fish that we're going to focus on, anadromous fish and catadromous fish. The first fish we're going to talk about are anadromous fish. Broken up, the word anadromous means uprunning or moving upward. So if you think about it, it's a fish that moves from the sea, from the ocean, salt water, up into freshwater systems. So up into streams and rivers that you see around Long Island. Some of the fish that do this around our region are Atlantic salmon, striped bass, sturgeon, and American shad. But today we're gonna to be focusing on river herring. And river herring is just a grouping of fish um, that include blueback and alewife. So these are the fish. You do not need to know the difference between them 
Um, you just simply have to know kind of the general information about what they look like. They're gonna be these small fish, no more than about 10 to 12 inches in size. And they have a forked tail. They're ve very silvery on the sides and they have a dark top, dark uh, dorsal side. Um, the alewife itself has a kind of bigger belly, you can see, um, than the blueback. But they appear in our streams uh, this time of year about the same time. There's a little bit of delay for the bluebacks, but about the same time. But again, for this training and this uh, survey, you do not need to know the difference, but they look kind of the same. And their ranges are a little bit different. Um, the alewife have a sh uh, smaller range, um, about up to Newfoundland, up to Maine, down to North Carolina, although the, the population numbers are pretty low in the Carolinas. And the blueback has a larger range. So you can see where they move in on the coast. Um, so during the winter time, what are they doing? They're hanging out in the Atlantic Ocean, um, feeding and doing what river herring do. And while they're out there, they're part of a, a very important food web. Um, and they're fed on by a number of different animals, including whales, um, cod, dolphins, tuna, very important food source out in the ocean. As spring approaches and the weather, the temperature changes in the ocean, the fish start moving in towards the continental shelf, towards the, towards the United States and into our estuaries. So they start moving into land. While they're in the estuaries, the areas where the rivers meet um, the ocean, where you have that mixing of brackish water, they're fed on by different predators. So again, another, another food web. Um, so things like seals and striped bass rely on these fish as they move in during the late winter into our estuaries. Now they hang out in the estuaries outside of these rivers and streams until the temperature of the water reaches a certain um, degree. Usually we say between 48 and 50 degrees Fahrenheit for that, for that uh, water temperature. And once they sense that, they start moving up into our rivers and streams. So now they're gonna start their spawning migration up into the freshwater systems. So here they go. This is them moving through the water. Now the thing to remember about river herring is they are moving up to spawn, just like you would see, let's say on a National Geographic special, where you'd see the Pacific salmon moving up river to spawn. But these fish are very different in their abilities. Um, salmon, you'll see these dramatic jumps over these massive um, hurdles in the streams. Uh, river herring, alewife and blueback herring don't have that ability, but they do have the ability to move rapidly um, through rivers and streams, but they cannot jump. So a small hurdle in a stream, even just to 12 inches or more, can, um, can be an obstacle that they cannot pass on a stream. So keep that in mind as we move forward with the discussion. So as they move into these rivers and streams, another set of predators are feeding on them and rely on them. So things like um, different herons and egrets that you might see, uh, cormorants, mammals like raccoons, uh, river, river otter, and important osprey. So the, all these animals are relying on these river herring entering our streams this time of year. They need these, animal, these fish for food. So when you see osprey in March diving into a, a local river um, in your area, they're more than likely looking for this important food source that's coming up river. And once they get into their freshwater systems, that's when they start spawning. Um, the males and the females meet up, um, they, the eggs get fertilized. A female can produce 60 to 100,000 eggs, which sounds like a lot, um, but it's important to remember that these uh, fish take almost three to five years to reach maturity. Um, so it's a very long time from egg to maturity for an animal to survive and actually reproduce themselves. So that's another thing to remember um, in their life history. So the, the adult males and females will come up to the freshwater system, they spawn, um, the adults leave the system within a few days. They do not hang out and they do not die um, like other animals you may hear about, they spawn and die. Um, not these animals, they don't do that. They leave and then they will repeat spawn. They'll come back the next year to the same stream, the same river or close by um, to their natal stream that they were born in. So they return year after year to the same stream where they were, um, where they were an egg. Um, so that's a pretty neat thing that they do. The eggs are tiny. Um, they're about 1.3 millimeters in diameter. They hatch the eggs in about three to six days. And then the young stay in the river systems for several months, usually to the end of the summer, early fall, when again, environmental indicators cue them to leave the system. And they head out into the estuary. Now remember, it takes three to five years. They'll go back down to the ocean and three to five years later, hopefully they will come back to their natal stream, the stream where they uh, were an egg and reproduce themselves. 
but we are concerned about them and that is why we're all here today and that's what we're trying to learn about. Um, there's a decline in river herring populations that we're very concerned about. Uh, at the moment, they're not currently listed for protection under the Endangered Species Act federally, and they're not state listed for New York. Although there is a, um, there is a, a no ability to possess these fish south of the George Washington Bridge, there, there is a protection on them, them in this area. But the populations are down, and the large part of that is due to overfishing and bycatch in the ocean. And we're talking about large scale fishing industry over many, many years. And you can see on the chart in this um, graphic, the commercial landings of river herring over time from the late 1800s to the, to the early 2000s, um, pretty much very uh, depleted. And that's a concern for us. Um, the numbers are low and overfishing and bycatch, the accidental catching of these fish in other fishing industries is a problem. And we're also concerned because these fish, you know, play an important part of our history here um, in America. You know, these fish at a time, Native Americans relied on them during the late winter, early spring as an important food source um, and also early colonialists. Um, you can imagine for people suffering through the winter and trying to get to that spring to see, you know, thousands of fish turn up one day in your stream that you can harvest and eat and you've survived the winter. That's a, a pretty miraculous thing. So these fish play important history in, uh, for America here in our local region. Another reason for their decline is habitat loss. And uh, Long Island looks very different than it did 100 or 200 or 300 years ago. And we have to keep that in mind. Um, humans have lived here a long time and humans have altered the environment for many years. Um, and the landscape of Long Island um, is, is altered in a sense that our waterways don't really flow the way that they used to. And for good reason. Because people, you know, you have to imagine people uh, saw the power of water as a source of energy to produce things. So people put dams on many of our rivers and streams um, long ago to harvest the energy from water to create things. So either like a grist mill or a textile mill, something to, to create energy uh, so they can make products. And so these two photos show you some examples of, these top photos show you examples of a, of a dam on the Carmen's River. And the Dam on the left, you can see it's a pretty large dam. And the picture on the right is the same dam uh, with the mill on it. Obviously, a lot of these mill houses don't exist anymore, but the dam structures still do on all of these rivers. And they're impounding water behind them and restricting the flow of the river. Um, but also, what I said before, alewife, bluebacks, they cannot jump very well. They cannot move past a structure like that in a river. Absolutely not. And so hitting something like that prevents them from getting to their spawning grounds. Another reason dams were created on Long Island, you can see the bottom left photo in Calverton, that is a cranberry pond. Dams were placed um, to harvest cranberries. And the bottom right photo is a picture from Southampton on an ice pond. Ice ponds are very uh, common on the south shore of Long Island. Again, people didn't have resources to refrigerate food. They needed ice. So of course they harvested ice all winter um, and created dams for that again, impacting uh, river herring travel. And on the, the graph on the right, or the chart on the right, really is showing the Carmen's River again, all of these impassable barriers on one river system on Long Island. So these are, these are, pos these are areas where river herring are not able to move past. And those are problems because now they don't have access to their spawning grounds and that impacts population, population numbers. So why do we care? Well, we care because of the ecological importance. We just went over how they are important food source, ocean, estuary, river. And uh, something to remember that these animals, their migrations sometimes are timed up with river herring. It's also an economic importance. So if you, uh, you, know, if you like to eat the, some of these uh, larger fish like striped bass and things and cod, you, know, you have to think about the smaller fish that these fish are eating. It's important for our area, for uh, ecotourism, seafood industry, um, and just recreational and commercial fisheries. So now back to diadromous fish again, fish moving between two different bodies of water. Now we're going to talk about catadromous fish, which is another fish we're going to ask you to learn about for this survey. And the one that we're concerned about in our area is American eel. And here's some pictures of some adult American eels. Um, these fish do the exact opposite of what the river herring are doing. They spend the majority of their life in freshwater systems and only and go back to the ocean to breed. So an opposite life cycle. And here's a little bit of uh, uh, some graphics to show you that. So their range is quite large. They are 
all over North America, South America, Central America, they're moving inland to those streams and rivers. But these eels are pretty neat because they all spawn out in the Sargasso Sea in the Atlantic Ocean and they start off as eggs and they go through a metamorphosis of their body in the ocean, moving from a larvae state into a glacial state. And then once they head into the streams and rivers around our area, they start to develop pigmentation. They get darker and bigger. They become yellow eels and eventually silver eels. And they live for decades in these river systems until the timing is right and they head back out to the Sargasso Sea to reproduce and then die. So pretty dramatic life cycle and pretty neat what's going on there. Um, this is the glass eels. So on top, you can see the glass eels. They don't really have their pigmentation yet. And at the bottom, you can kind of see that they've already transitioned to that darker pigmentation for the stream system. And there's an alewife in that uh, bottom photo as well. So these are the eels that you're going to be looking for, not those big monster eels that we just showed in the early photo, but these little guys who are heading from the ocean into their, uh, the place they're going to live for many years, into the river systems around Long Island. And we care about these guys too, because their numbers are down as well. Um, so there's a major concern that we're losing large population numbers of, of eels in our area. And that these dams that we just talked about, another issue for them too, because they cannot pass very large dams. Although they can make it up small ones, they can't pass very large ones. So we're gonna ask you to look for these two in our survey. So what are we doing to, to protect these animals? Um, we are trying to restore their population numbers and we're trying to um, implement fish passage. So the so the good news is um, we have a, we've established a Long Island Dadermas Fish Work Group, which is, includes a number of partners around our area that are concerned and working on um, restoring fish passage or fish movement in our streams and counting fish numbers. Um, and we've been working hard to get that done. So even though these dams, they can come out, that's one option. We can try to identify dams that take them out so that their fish can pass through into their uh, spawning grounds. Or on the bottom right photo and the top right photo, we can install a fish passage. A fish passage on the top right show photo is from the Peconic River. That's a more natural looking fish passage where it looks more like a stream or a creek, but it's very much engineered for the fish to move up into the freshwater. The bottom right photo is more of a uh, structural engineered fish passage. It's naturally like a ladder where the fish enter the box in the bottom and travel through baffles up the ladder into the freshwater pond above. And that's a good solution when we can't take the dam out. So we have a, uh, developed a Long Island Dadramus Fish Strategy Guide where we've identified priority sites to do fish passage and dam removal around Long Island. We have an interactive map we're gonna talk more about in the breakout sessions to help you find sites where there's fish passage, where there's dams, where there are a river herring and eels. And we've installed over 10 fish passage projects around Long Island with more coming up in the next few years. So we're actively doing this and important part to say here is that this survey directly feeds into all of that work. And the survey itself has, you know, like Amanda said in the beginning, it's 15 years old um, about, and we've, for every year, we've had volunteers come out, you know, every year it's about 50 to 100 citizen science help us. And this is the, the complete truth that the citizen scientists have helped us find many tributaries where we did not know there were remnant remaining runs of river herring still left around Long Island. And just knowing that information as practitioners, people who are trying to restore river herring around Long Island is very important because if we don't know that river herring are showing up at a stream near your house, near your neighborhood, then we cannot fight and try to find funding and try to get support to actually take out the dam or put in fish passage and restore fish access. So the, surveys, the survey itself that you're gonna participate in directly impacts restoration. And I, and I hope that point comes across in the breakout sessions as well. Um, so we've, volunteers have found over 20 remnant, run, remnant runs of river herring around Long Island since the survey started. So that's, that's something to just point out. It, these are regular people just going out and checking for river herring. So what is the survey? This is gonna be the basics. I'm just gonna give you the basics and Emily's gonna go into the, the logistics. So the point is that we need you to go out and look for river herring and eels migrating into tributaries during the spring. The time period is about March to May. It's all temperature dependent, but that's the, that's the heat of the, the moment, March to May. Um, we want you to go out and, and find, tell us, um, are river herring and eels making these migration spawning runs in the river that you're looking at? Um, we want you to tell us um, you know, when they're making these spawning runs. And you want to estimate the size of these spawning runs. So the, are they 
when, and the size. Those are very important. Um, and we're going to explain to you in the breakout sessions where to look, but you're going to be looking at places that are just downstream of the first impassable barrier on the stream. So remember, they can't get past the dam or a structure in the stream. So you don't want to look above it because there's no way they're going to get in there. You don't want to look in the ponded section above the dam. You want to look below it in the tidal section. So you want to look at a place where its flow is somewhat constricted, water is clear, and water is shallow. I'm going to go over that a little bit. So when do you do this survey? You do it at regular intervals, preferably as much as you can go out. You know, this is volunteer. So the more you go, the, the better. But we want you to vary your times, time of day, uh, difference in tidal cycles. Go, go at different times because these fish will do different things at different locations depending on pred predation or activity in the area. So some, some locations might be early morning, some might be um, late in the evening, some might be only high tide. You know, so you've got to change it up a little bit. And you gotta remember that these fish are, 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 have evolved to be cryptic and to camouflage. So you gotta go to these sites and you've gotta spend some, a little bit of time there just getting used to the water and looking at the water and looking for these fish because they're cryptic. So it's just, just like a little image I just showed you, um, same dam on the Carmen's River. So if you went to this dam, you would be the star and you'd be looking down below the dam. You would not be looking up into that pond. You'd be looking down below the dam. And there on the right is just an aerial image of a stream near where I live. And again, you can see on the aerial image, the it's Montauk Highway. Montauk Highway has lots of dams. Um, you can see that Montauk Highway is the dam, right? And you would be looking below into the spillway below the pond. You would not be looking into the pond. I just want to emphasize that because sometimes people have questions about that. So the fish are going to get stuck where there's the obstruction. They're not going to be able to make it usually into the pond. Okay, and this is just an image from one of our, our largest um, alewife runs on the Long Island, the Peconic River. That's thousands of alewife. All those dark images in that pond below the dam in the spillway, that's all alewife. So thousands of alewife show up in the Peconic River right below this impassable barrier here. Um, they're cryptic, so below is a carp. You know, that's you might see a carp, very different body shape to an alewife, very thin, darkish top, so silver sides, forked tail. Um, here's an easier way to look at it in a light background, all those slivers of dark, alewife. So it's good to spend about 15 minutes at your site all the time before you say, nope, no alewife. Just give yourself 15 minutes to look and adjust your eyes to the water and try to find them. Here's some brook trout. You can see they're speckled, not alewife. Fish on the right, thin, alewife. Here's bunker. Now this has been a common misconception every year for the last two or three years because bunker numbers are up around Long Island. You probably heard that on the news. So there have been bunker in some locations where alewife might be, but bunker look very different. Their mouths are open. You can see their mouths are open. They have that yellowish on the tail and they usually are trying to feed or move around in circles. Alewife tend to just be circling below an impassable barrier. They're not feeding. They're just circling below an impassable barrier trying to figure out how to get above it. Um, you might not see the fish, but you might see scales on the side of the river. So make sure you look for scales around the edges of the bank of the, of the river. And here's some scales and some leaves there. And I don't know if this video, if we're gonna have time for it, but we might skip ahead. Um, but let me get to um, Emily. I don't wanna, there we go, whoops. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave this for Emily because we're just at 20 minutes. So Emily, do you want to go over the logistics of the um, getting your data into the uh, app? Sure. Thank you, Vicki. Wonderful summary. All right, I'm going to take over screen sharing for a little bit. Okay, just bear with me one moment. Okay, so I'm going to show you a couple different ways to access our river herring and eel survey, and then I'll also talk a little bit about um, what's uh, entailed in the survey itself. Okay, so the first way to access the survey is you can just go to your browser on your computer or on your phone. The best way to do that is by going to ctuck.org. You can then navigate through our menu to get involved. Scroll down through community science to volunteer river herring and eel survey. 
Once you're on that page, you'll find some background information on the survey. You'll also find all the information for our trainings. The 2021 River Herring and Eel Survey is then embedded into our web page itself. So this is one way that you can access the survey and input all your data. The other way that you can access the survey is through the Survey123 field app. The first step to doing that is to download the free Survey123 uh, mobile app on your mobile device. And you can see I've already done that here. That's the green app there. The next um, part of this is that you can either scan the QR code with your phone or you can click this link. Now the link will give you again two options. Option one is to open in your browser, which brings up the entire survey onto your browser. So it's not necessarily embedded in our web page, but it's just available on your browser. And then the second way would be open in the Survey123 field app and you just follow through the prompts. Open this page in Survey123. Okay, so now we're on the Survey123 main page. An important thing here is that you do not need an ArcGIS Survey123 account to get into the app. You do not need to log in through Survey123. So when it says sign in, you don't have to do that. You just say continue without signing in. And that will bring you directly to the survey. So now I'm gonna go over some of the data that we collect. First, name, email, river and stream. So which waterway are you uh, surveying? So we have a host of different streams throughout Long Island on this list. Um, they often start with the stream name, some sort of identifier often. It could be a road, it could be a pond that the stream is on. Um, if a stream has multiple viewing locations, you'll see multiple different identifiers in that and you could pick the one that most fits where you are. And then we include the town as well. Okay, the next part is the geolocation. Um, this part is really important because we wanna know exactly where you're surveying. So if your location services are on on your phone, which means that uh, you tell Survey123 that they can use your location while using the app. It should automatically populate with where you are. So where you are on Long Island should automatically pop up here. If your location services are off, or if you look at the map and it's seeming like a little weird, like it's not the location where you are, you can easily go to the map and enter it manually. So this is actually a good example because I'm not on Long Island currently, I'm in Connecticut. Um, but if I saw that I was on Long Island and my pointer was somewhere else, um, I could easily remedy that. So the first thing you could do is press your home button here, the little house button, and that will bring you to the extent of Long Island. The next thing you could do is you could either zoom in and out, move around the island just with your fingers, and that will be a helpful way that you can navigate to different streams. The only thing about that is when you're moving around with your fingers or zooming in and out, it's gonna move where your location is. If you wanna keep your location constant, you can use your sidebar plus to zoom in and minus to zoom out, and that'll keep your location uh, constant. Also, you can change your base map. So if you don't wanna see world imagery and you wanna see a world street map or something else that might be more helpful to you, you can do that as well. And then lastly, if you want to go back to where you thought you were geolocated or if it was actually correct, you can just press the little button with the crosshairs and it'll tell you where it, uh, where your phone has you. Then you just click the check mark and it'll log where you are. Then we ask the date and time of when you survey and that should auto populate for you. If not, you can easily change that as well. Next, we ask for the title stage. So we added a little link here that you can look um, for a resource um, in terms of what tide it is. Again, I'm in Connecticut, so it's a little confusing, but if I click on nearby tides in Hartford, I can see that the last high tide was at 1.26 p.m. And then the next tide, the low tide, is at 9.17 p.m. I'm gonna go back to survey one, two, three. And if I survey between high tide and low tide, then I'm gonna be surveying on the falling tide. If I survey between low tide and high tide, then I'm gonna be surveying at the rising tide. And slack tide 
is when you go just around high tide or low tide, like maybe just an hour around that time and the water will kind of stay stable and won't be moving um, in the other direction yet. All right, we also ask for the water temperature. If you know that, and if you have maybe a little field thermometer you can use. The weather, is it bright and cloudy? Is it kind of a rainy day? Is it overcast? And then the most important part um, are whether or not river herring are present, yes or no, approximately how many there are. American eels, are they present? Approximately how many there are. And then another part is other species. So if you see other types of fish, um, like um, Vicki was saying, if you see bunker, or if you see um, ospreys are really important indicators, perhaps of river herring, or even if you see signs of otters, um, like scat or latrine sites, um, and you can go back to our Otter Watch um, webinar and get some tips on that, but you can log those species into this box. Then we also have places where you can upload photos, and then we have an additional section for notes. All right, then basically what you do is you press that check mark, that'll submit your survey. I have not entered any data. You can also click the X mark in the upper corner and you can either say close and lose changes, continue the survey, or you can save it in drafts. So if you don't wanna complete the survey now, but you wanna come back to it later, you can do that. So I'm gonna close and lose changes. But I also wanted to show this main homepage of the survey one, two, three site. You can see I have all my other uh, survey apps on this page. So once I close out of my survey one, two, three app, I can merely go back into it, continue without signing in, and then all my apps are still there. So I can log any survey, I can go back to the 2021 survey, I can finish my drafts, all of that. All right, so I will stop screen sharing now and give it back to Jimena to lead us into our breakout groups. Great, thanks so much, Emily and Vicki. Um, and I'd just like to remind everybody again that this is being recorded. We know that this is a lot of information. It's going a little bit fast, um, but we'll have uh, those, everything you just heard in video um, in the Community Science webpage for you to access later as well. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open the breakout groups. Um, some of you are already assigned based on your answers when you registered, but um, a lot of you are not. So I'm going to go ahead and open the breakout groups. Um, and the ones who remain, um, feel free to tell me in the chat where you'd like to be, north, east, south. Um, and we'll take it from there. All right. See you there. All right, we can give folks just another second to join if they haven't yet. Okay. Well, I'm gonna start off by sharing my screen. I'm gonna share the River Revival map. Can everyone see that? Okay, great. Um, so before I get into this map, I know that I read in the chat, it seemed like some people still had questions about the survey. Does anyone have any quick questions on that they need answered or anything unclear? I have no idea how to find any of this. I went to, oops, that page can't be found. I'm on my phone, I'm trying to find this. I can't find it at all. Somebody put it in the thing, but I'm trying to find it on my phone and I don't have that on my, I don't have what was in the chat on my phone, trying to type it in. Everything goes so fast, you can't do anything. Sure, no, yeah, sorry about that. Um, we have a, you know, we've a limited time for the uh, presentation. So I know it went a little quick. Um, so basically you can, like you said, we can, you can download the survey one, two, three app through your app store, or you can just go to ctuck.org, go to our volunteer river herring and survey page and find it through your browser. Um, yeah. But what That's I can the page do, I can't find the volunteer. All it brings me to is how to register for these different talks, the citizens. Okay. Talk. 
so yeah, so it might be a different link that you're going to. So if you go to ctuck.org's homepage, or Ariel might be sharing the uh, the link in the chat for me, great. Um, it's a different page in the community science webinar series. So if you scroll down a little bit um, on the volunteer river hanging survey page, it'll give you more information. But um, but I am going to well, Ariel, if you could put our emails in the chat for uh, for Kathy too, yeah. you can get in touch with us and we can walk you through this a little slower because I know it's a little quick today. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so I just want to introduce myself again. Hi, my name is Emily Hall. Um, I work with SeaTac Environmental Association and. I, um, I work a lot with our river revival program and our diadromous fish program. So we do a lot of great work with um, river restoration and helping to run this training series. And volunteers like you are super valuable as Vicki mentioned. Um, I also have with me today, Ariel Santos, our policy program coordinator and Enrico Nardone, our executive director. Um, and they can help answer your questions. Um, they're gonna help uh, put some extra resources into the chats and help lead the the discussion as well. Um, a couple things I just wanted to point out, Ariel's going to point in the chat, is our river herring protocol. So these are some extra helps, extra steps on how to do the survey, how to access the Survey123 app, all those other things that you can find in the protocol. We're also going to put in a South Shore Streams guide. Um, so that's going to be, it's not totally comprehensive, but it's going to be a guide to some of our top survey locations that we kind of need help with. Um, so that'll be in the chat as well. And then lastly, there's a participant info form. So if you can uh, fill that out when you have the time, that would be great. And you could give us your information, tell us where you're interested in uh, surveying, and we'd be happy to get in touch with you more as well if you have any additional questions or are still kind of confused um, by all this. I know it's a little bit of a complicated thing on how to get to the app and everything, but well, we'd be happy to take the time to walk you through that. Okay. So I am gonna go over our river herring, uh, river revival map quick. So you can see this up here. You can find this through our SeaTuck website on our river revival page. And um, Ariel, I don't know if you could maybe share the link in the chat for that as well. Okay. So we have all streams mapped here from Nassau County out in Valley Stream all the way out to Montauk. I want to go over some of the things that we highlight on each stream. I zoomed in a little bit too much there. Okay. So each stream either has a fish, a river herring icon, or it doesn't. Um, when it has a river herring icon, that means that we have found evidence of river herring there in the past. If it doesn't have a river herring icon, that means we haven't found evidence of river herring there yet. If the stream part, part of it is green, that means it is accessible to river herring. So that means they can freely access the green part of the stream. Where there are stars or these little red markers, that means there is a barrier or a dam. And that means that fish cannot move up through that, um, through that fish or barrier. Did you, you eat all your um, However, there are certain um, dams or project, or there are certain barriers where we actually have done projects or put in spillways. So when we've done projects, we, you can see when you click on the, um, the little star or red icon, we go through all that information here. We talk about what the project was, we talk about where the funding came from, all this sort of stuff. And then we, when the project's completed, we actually show in the blue section of the stream that access has been restored. So that river herring can now get up to the stream, but they couldn't before. And you see in terms of Massapequa Creek as well, that there's an additional barrier upstream. So fish still don't have access to this upper portion of the stream here. So just in comparison, um, we can look at Belmar Creek as well. And you see that there's access all the way up to the first barrier um, where it's still there and we are currently doing a project on it, but the barrier is still in place and you cannot move up, the river herring cannot move upstream. All right, so I'm gonna start by going over a couple of the kind of data gaps that we have, a couple on the areas that we need a little extra help with. 
And then after I do that, feel free to jump in, raise your hand um, or go into chat and tell us if there's streams near you that you have questions about or that you're curious about that you don't quite know how to access. Okay, so the first area I wanna talk about is the East End. Um, this is a huge data gap for us. We often don't have enough people that are able to survey this area. Um, which has led us to not really understand whether river herring are present in a lot of these kind of smaller bays and creeks. Um, you can see that um, over here on um, the Carmens, there is river herring here. So it could be possible that there's river herring um, in some of the Mastic Center Riches, uh, West Hampton Beach area as well. And there's still some barriers there. Um, that we'd like to, you know, be interested in seeing their access to, but there's a lot of open streams as well and just open access. So it's an important area. Um, so if you live around that area, you can definitely check, check out our uh, South Shore Streams guide. We have info on how to access a lot of those different sites. Okay, I'm gonna go back a little bit. Um, another big portion, you know, that we're constantly looking mm -hmm. at is some of these um, smaller Nassau streams. Um, so, for instance, a couple of the ones that we're doing projects on currently, um, as I mentioned, Belmore Creek. So right here, that's in Wanta and Mill Pond. Um, we are currently working with an advisory committee here and a contractor to design a new fish passage for this system and to understand what type of fish passage um, might be best. So we are always eager to understand what level of river herring are there or the amount of river herring that are there that each season. And this is a very, a very easily accessible site. You basically can just pull off Merrick Road Park and go and easily look at the spillway. Okay. Another stream in NASA we want to learn more about is I showed you Massapequa Creek a little while ago. Um, this stream actually has two spillways, which makes it a little interesting, an east spillway, or a west spillway, and an east spillway. Um, the west spillway does have fish passage, as I mentioned. Um, so fish are able to get up into the pond, but there's still fish coming into uh, the east spillway. So we often are eager to have volunteers go here as well to understand if there's still a significant difference between the spillways and if they're accessing uh, one spillway over another, and if they're actually being able to get to the fish ladder to move upstream. We also really don't have a great information on this stream in terms of whether or not they're able to get up to this second barrier. Um, so we would welcome and encourage volunteers if you're in that area to go maybe to this tighter portion of water here or up until the second barrier here as well to see if there are river herring that are able to get up here. Okay. And then I wanted to talk about to the Carl's River in Babylon. Um, some of you may know that one. Um, there was a barrier here. There's, well, there still is kind of. Um, there. There's that uh, historical three spillway section, the beautiful historical spillway is there. Um, and Tuck helped install a project, do a fish ladder here. Um, so that does allow now access to the upper portion of the Carls River into Argyle Lake. However, again, like Massapequa, we don't know whether or not they're able to move upstream, whether or not they're able to move really far. Um, so we'd welcome and encourage volunteers to come and take a look at this site, maybe up near Souther the barrier at Southard's Pond and give us some more information on whether River Herring are able to get up there. And then lastly, I just wanted to talk quickly about Sampawalms Creek. Um, that's right near the town of Babel, um, Babylon Town as well. Um, this is a really interesting site. This was actually newly discovered for river herring just last year. Um, it's pretty easy to access. You could just park at kind of one of the nearby streets like Cooper Street and walk over. Um, but we'd be really eager here too to learn whether or not more river herring are coming here. As I mentioned, it was, it's a newly discovered run just from last year. So we'd be eager to get more eyes on that as well since it's so, um, so newly discovered. Okay, I 
think I touched on most of the ones that uh, we were interested in getting a little extra help. Oh, wait, actually, no, there's one more, a big one. Um, so lastly, another one um, that we'd welcome more help on, we welcome more help on any of these streams, but here are some of our just kind of bigger picture ones is um, Quinnequat River West Pond. So this actually used to be a pond. Um, there was a dam here, but it got, uh, it failed in 2019 after a really big storm. So basically that opened up this entire stream here um, to be freely accessible to River Herring. Um, it's still um, not certain on whether or not they're gonna put the dam back. Uh, it's New York's uh, New York Parks property. So currently they're doing an analysis on the stream bed and the system and whether or not they should put the dam back. Um, but it would be really helpful for us to understand whether River Herring are able to access this site or not. Um, and if so, if they're able to move upstream a bit. And it's a beautiful site, tons of rare and native species there. Um, it's just a really, really interesting site, especially in terms of removing a dam and what, what it can do to the system. Okay, so um, Enrico or Ariel, I don't know if either of you had any other thoughts or streams you'd like to touch on quick, but I'll um, pass the mic over to you guys quick before we get into any questions. Uh, this is Enrico. I would just add that one thing that's always um, a challenge are um, rivers and streams that have their first barriers surrounded by private property. Um, there's there's a few examples like uh, Champlain's Creek and Islip. If you happen to know landowners that live by a um, a, a dam um, and you can get access to it, those are th th those are that's fantastic help for us because we're it's likely that those sites have not been surveyed. So something to think about. Just to add um, in the chat, I entered the 2021 protocol, the South Shore Streams PDF, um, a link to the river revival map, the contact information sheet, and again, the link to the River Herring survey. So if you have any issues accessing those links or, or anything like that, just let me know and I'll be able to assist you. Hey, uh, great. Thank you, Ariel and Enrico. So does anyone have any questions or any streams um, that they're interested in surveying that they'd like to learn a little bit more about? Sorry, I I actually uh, miss, this is uh, Chris Buckman, I actually teach in Port Washington, but I actually live near the Connequat. Which part was it? Right. Is it the west or the east? Is it Actually. Sure. Um, so yeah, so it's always helpful to have surveying in all three um, okay. of those tributaries if you're able to. Um, but the one that we're kind of really um, pinpointing is Westbrook Pond. So okay. it's the westernmost um, stream there. And there's a couple different ways to access it. Um, I wrote that all up in the South Shore Streams guide as well. Um, you can park in the park itself um, and walk down. There's a little like bike path. You can walk under um, Sunrise Highway and kind of walk around to the dam. Or I, I'm not sure, I don't know if you're Enrico, if you know if this has been updated, but you used to be able to park like right here on Montauk, on the side of Montauk Highway and just walk right to the dam. But I don't, I don't know if that's um, been changed. Okay, great, thank you. Hi, I don't want to interrupt, but um, I do know that if you park on the side of the road there, you're going to get ticketed by the police. Okay, All right. they do that, yeah, because I, I know we um, we used to do that, and I, I think they might have updated that, so thank you. <laughs> this is George Costa, again, a question to Enrico uh, concerning the meeting we would have tomorrow if it's still on for the commons. Tried to get yes. a hold of you today, but no yes, answer. George, sorry, four o'clock. Okay. Thank you. W would you mind um, going back over some of the sites in far western Nassau County 
I'm on the Rockaway Peninsula in Queens and I'm wondering what might be accessible close to me. Thank you. Oh, Enrico, do you want to jump in here? Because I feel like you might be more familiar with some of these sites. Uh, yeah, um, you know, there's still some unknowns there. Some of those uh, systems uh, coming out of um, uh, the Western Bays, we and and even those um, the sites that come out of the far eastern end of Jamaica Bay, uh, we're just we just started exploring those over the past couple of years. So you know, all of those are good sites. We, you know, our, those those two those two streams uh, in Valley Stream. Uh, we've had just, they were just documented for the first time a few years ago. We, we'd love to get some more information about, you know, they weren't, we didn't have any luck last year. It'd be great to see if the fish are back this year. Um, the, uh, the Mill River is a, a site in, that flows through uh, um, from Bay Park up to, up, up through Rockville Center. The, we know the fish can get under sunrise up to Smith Pond. Um, we had several thousand fish there a few years ago. Last year, we, you know, we never saw more than a few dozen. So we're we're a little concerned about that run and hope that that it sort of bounces back this year. So the you know it may be that they're not reaching the dam. They might be staying below sunrise. So that's the site where we'd like to get some more eyes on the on the river. Um, uh, I don't know, Emily, can you zoom back in there to those sites? I can't remember. Sure, sorry, yeah, I jumped off this uh, map for, for a second, but yes. Yeah. So yeah, um, we have the two here. Yeah. Yeah, we've we've had fish in, in Milburn Creek and Baldwin just recently. Um, uh, going a little further East, you know, one I've always I've tried to find fish in the, with the Meadowbrook Creek, and we've not had any luck. It's a hard stream to sort of get get to, but I, I you know, there's a lot of people feel like they there should be a remnant run there somewhere. Um, that's a good one. So yeah, and, you know, all of the I think there's still a lot to learn about all of these systems. And Thank if you me. want to reach out to me about you know more specific details, uh, well, I'll put my email in the chat and. Happy to talk about it some more. Thank you. Yep. Um, hi, guys. I live near the Beaver Dam Creek. It's just west of the Carmen's River. It's not highlighted on the map. If you'd be interested in getting data from in there. Um, so just west of yeah, we Bellport Bay. And also, I work with the Park Service, and I can, can get into Home Creek on the William Floyd Estate. Yeah, that's a good one. We, yeah, we have not. Okay, I can absolutely get in there with a couple of probably interns. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And Beaver Dam Creek is a site where, you know, there's been some evidence of a, of a um, native brook trout population. Mm -hmm. uh, it's There's no barriers that, that we know of, and they're you know, but we have not had uh, success documenting river herring there. So, uh, two. You know, those are two good options. If you have mm -hmm. a chance to get to them, that'd, that'd be great to yeah. know. I used to go years years ago. I used to go to Beaver Dam Creek. Never saw anything in there. It's, it is accessible. Yeah. Is the brook? Are there still brook trout, George? Are they? As far as I know, they're still there right in the area where the Brookhaven town has their park. There's about a 200 foot section from that park going out mm -hmm. down river where the only brook trout that I know why well, was there doing the shot stocking years ago. I have pictures, you know, I have plenty of slides of it uh, were there. That's the only section I know that exists. Anything north of that by the houses and stuff as going towards Montauk mm -hmm. is as eels but it's too, too narrow for, as far as I know, any book trout. But they're there in the park. We actually got some in the park. And, and on another note, you might want to mention to all the groups, a good pair of Polaroid glasses are needed, especially to cut the glare on the water. You can see fish a lot better if you're a fisherman with Polaroids on. So if you can pass that along, if they have a good pair of Polaroids, they'll be able to see 
underneath the water a lot better, especially on a sunny, wavy day. Yeah, that's good advice, George. Um, it does help a lot. And you know, one thing I like to reiterate to people that Vicky mentioned in, in the introduction is just patience. And um, you know, we do ask people to sort of stay for 15 minutes. And you know, your first reaction might be when you get to a site is to sort of take a look and not see anything and then wonder why we want you to stay there for 14 more minutes. Um, and it's because they're they're, you know, these fish are cryptic by by design. They're they're hard to see. And even people who have been looking for them for a long time can miss them when you're just, you know, you got to give your eyes a chance to adjust uh, to the to the light and to the water and and sort of uh, zero in on the right depth. And and then they you know, they're moving around. So, you know, you gotta kind of one good technique is to find a, um, a, a light spot where there's some sand with a light background and just watch it. And then the fish, if they're in, this, in the area, they might be not visible against a darker background, but as they're, as they're circling around, they'll cross over this, the, the lighter patch and all of a sudden sort of appear to you. Um, I, I always tell the story of, of having a, been at a site, the Mill River actually that I mentioned earlier uh, with my then eight or nine year old daughter and, and looking at some big carp that were in the, in the spillway. I didn't, I didn't see any river herring. And I, I asked her if she saw the big, the big fish swimming around and, uh, she, she didn't, I gave her my polarized glasses, which then she, she, she saw the big carp and then she said, Oh, and there's lots of little ones too. And I, I said, why? Well, you know, I took my glasses back and sure enough, like we had been standing there for 10 or 20 minutes and, there, she was right. There were river herring swimming around in the spillway, and I, I just completely missed them. So, um, it does take some some patience and uh, some time. Um, I just had a question about counting eel. So, like, it seemed from the presentation that they are super tiny. So, like, obviously the herring are kind of a little easier to see, but these look like. If you're not literally standing on top of the water, you might not see them. Like, is there techniques that you guys prefer to find that? Like, are buckets and nets a good idea? You can try. You could. I mean, we. You know, we, technically, you're not allowed to possess them, so you. You know, you'd be careful about getting, having the environmental conservation officers catch you with nets, <laughs> um, because there is a poaching. You know, they're very valuable fish, and there's a poaching threat against them. So, I would caution against against that. But they're gonna. Uh, they're going to be hugging the sides of the stream. If they're in a, in what we, you know, we refer to the spillway, the sort of the built concrete or stone structure, they're going to be on the, on the edges, uh, on the, on the sort of, you know, east or west side of a spillway, hugging, hugging the wall, uh, sometimes right at the surface of the water. And then they're going to congregate um, right at the base of the dam. They're going to try, they're going to try to stay out of the main flow of the stream. So really looking to the edges and then, they, as Vicky said, they are just remarkable, remarkable fish, and they can they can climb um, to some extent uh, vertical walls if there's enough texture for them uh, to hold on to. They they don't they don't grip, but they like snakes. They can as long as they have two points to push against, they can kind of shimmy themselves up. So you want to look on the edges of the main flow where the where there's where there's some some moisture and uh, and. It, they won't be on the dry section. There'll be a little bit of water, uh, and they'll be they'll be climbing up. And they're, they, it's going to be it's very hard to count them. So we're looking for estimates of are there you know are there five or six of them? Are there fifty or sixty? Are there are there five hundred? Um, uh, it's just best best you can tell. And when they're when you see them, you're generally going to see quite a few of them. I mean they'll they tend to you know they're coming in in waves together and you'll, you know, you, you don't usually see it just a couple. You're usually going to see, you know, dozens or hundreds at a time. And they are, when they first come in to the fresh water, they are, they are translucent. They have no pigmentation. Uh, it's only after they spend, start spending some time in fresh water that they start to gain pigment. So um, sometimes when they're translucent, they're actually against um, uh, sort of turbid water, sort of dark, dark water, they almost glow at times. They're just, they're, they can be really easy to see. 
Uh, on the other hand, if it's if it's if it's bright and there's some there's a lot of light and they're translucent, they just they're almost like invisible. They're like just they disappear. So um, they can be tricky. But when they're when there's a lot of them, they're hard to miss if you're looking for them. And are there any uh, specific laws that we should be aware of in regards to places that are on private property? Like obviously, like don't be a dick, but. Um, yeah. <laughs> like anything other than that yeah no you just you know i would yeah not just stay off private property or or ask you know tell somebody you're you're interested in surveying you know potentially important site and we you know if you can get permission to do that that's great um yeah i yeah I, otherwise you know the other laws are just you know these fish you should you can't possess them so they just don't do that and you know to, along those lines uh if you see people um, especially at night, if, you see, if you're driving by a site where you know there's a, a stream and a dam and you see people with flashlights, uh, you know, you, should, they, you could, we would urge you to call the, the uh, DEC environmental conservation hotline number because they may be poaching eels. So something else to watch for. But, um, but on the, the night topic, um, I also should should mention that we have been seeing some evidence yeah. of some of the runs though coming in more heavily at night, which is really interesting. Um, so, so if you can safely observe a location at night and it's not in like private property or something. So for instance, like um, Belmore Creek, sometimes I've gone to at night, you know, with a friend, with a buddy um, and kind of just looked for uh, river herring and I've found them more often there at night than I have during the day. Um, so, so that's just kind of another um, interesting time. If you're able to survey at night, you can. Um, but like Enrico mentioned, it could be um, tricky. So maybe bring a friend or something. <laughs> if someone thinks um, you're poaching or you know encountering, you can just um, let them know that you're you're just surveying. But but yeah, and if you if you encounter you know anything like that or any problems or you know want to look at a site and are not sure to ac how to access it or if you can you know feel free to contact us. We can you know help you through that and maybe coordinate with you um, to see if we can get into a site that we're not sure if it's public or private or not. Um, I have a question. I live along uh, Mud Creek and I see it on your map that a fish ladder was installed where Mud Creek, um, in East Patchog, where Mud Creek kind of uh, goes under South Country Road. So I was wondering if you would recommend do the fish or the eels, would they still tend to congregate near the fish ladder or should I try to go as far upstream as in the green area on your map as I possibly can? Um, I would, you know, they're gonna congregate um, at, the, at the barrier, even, even with the fish ladder there. Fish ladders are, you know, they're not, they're not perfect. There's some issues, you know, fish, fish don't find them sometimes and they're, that's so that's a good site um and then you know once if we can document them there um you know once they're past once they're past a barrier with help of a ladder then you know the question then is how far upstream are they going are they are they staying in the in the that impoundment uh, and spawning there or are they continuing further upstream so um you know they're hard to find in in, in a you know in a pond that once they're in a pond you know, they're going to be hard to see. So we usually, you know, you should try to look for these fish as sort of the pinch points and barriers that where they're, where they congregate. But I'm not, that's Mud Creek. What's the, where's the fish ladder there? Because that doesn't sound familiar to me. Yeah, that's what I'm questioning. I don't think it, I mean, yeah, that's not a, yeah, can you zoom in there? That's, yeah, we have that yeah. starred, I think, because that's a site that we, oh, Robinson Pond, yeah. Right. And then, right. And, yeah, okay. there, there's nothing there. There's no fish ladder there that I know of, Enrico. There's a star there, I think, and it says fish ladder. Oh, but do you think it's? Mm, yeah, that was fun. Yeah, no, that's a that was the site that was. There was some funding for that. That was never installed. Okay. Okay. So that's that's a good yeah. site actually. It's a if you can we get can there and, and document fish there, that's a good reason to try to to revive that project. 
the only access there is along Montauk Highway as it goes into Robinson Lake, right underneath Montauk. I've been there and you really got to catch the tide. If you got low tide, there's practically almost no water coming out. And, uh, mm. The only water coming out of there is very low from the lake itself. But that's it. Uh, I've never seen anything in there. The next one east would be Swan River, which we know has them. I've spotted them there. Uh, an interesting note, though, Mud Creek above where uh, Robinson's duck farm, not Robinson's, where um, used to be the duck farm in Patchogue on Montauk Highway. Mm -hmm. That little creek up there still has brook trout in it. Doesn't look uh, like it with a big apartment complex. It has brook trout in it, unbelievably. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah the Swan River is a good one. We, you know, there's funding in just about all the funding necessary in place to put fish passage in. There's a design ready to go. Um, it's a, it's a little stalled, I think. And I think if, you know, there's more people looking at that site and, and documenting river herring there and helping to uh, nudge the town along to sort of put, you know, to implement that, that project would be good. And your best site there on that is Sweezy Road, which is uh, just south of Montauk. That's, uh, that's the best spot to spot the, El the Elwives there. The park itself on Montauk is a little bit awkward. It runs too fast for you to see them that much. Yeah. But that's, you're right on the highway. You can park on the side and they're easy to spot over there. Yep. So we're at 6.38, um, a little over time, but um, people are welcome to stay on if they have um, some additional questions. Um, I also just want to note before, um, if, if we don't, before we end, is that we are having three additional regional trainings next week. Um, that will be March 2nd, March 3rd, and March 4th. The South Shore one will be March 4th. So if you feel like you'd like to maybe go over some of this info again, or just kind of want another refresher on it, um, that'll be next Thursday, March 4th, I believe at 4 p.m. Um, so yeah, you can check on our website to register for that as well, but it'll be, it'll be pretty much all the same info, um, just uh, focused on South Shore streams and we'll go over the app and everything again. So if you feel like you just kind of want another refresher on it, you're welcome to join us there as well. I just, I just remembered one additional site that we, would, we should prioritize is, is the Panadequit Creek in Bayshore, which is yes, okay. a site that we have, that Department of Transportation um, installed fish passage at Montauk Highway five or six years ago. Uh, we have yet to document any river herring there. And I, you know, I know I've, I've looked, I know some others have worked hard to find fish there, but um, no luck yet. So if you can get there, it's that Montauk site and just looking at that fish, fish passage, um, they should be visible if they're moving through there. More eyes, the better. And there's going to be a way for us to connect with other volunteers to figure out who's checking out what so we can most effectively spread ourselves out, right? Sure. So actually through the, um, if people were able, I saw that the form I sent out earlier, people weren't able to um, access it. I hope people were now, but um, the form, if you fill that out, will tell me where, where you are and kind of what part of the South Shore you'd like to survey. So um, that information will come to us and then we can kind of help sp spread people out if people are not sure where to go or, um, you know, people want to go to a spot not as frequently surveyed. But, um, but I'd say we could probably use all the help we can get anywhere. So <laughs> um, more surveying, the better. So um, definitely don't feel restricted um, of going to, you know, maybe one of these sites that were, you know, more frequently surveyed or easy to survey. We can always use the help. Yeah, there's a lot we still don't know about what drives the, the, the movement of fish, you know, they, what tides they're, they're on or not. And um, there does seem to be, they pulse, you know, some evidence that they pulse in and out. They don't just, it's not just a one-time of uh, spawning visit. So, and then, you know, and then as Emily said, we know that they, in certain systems, they, they seem to, to move at night or you know, at least dawn and dusk. So, you know, having multiple people on the same site is fine. The more, as I said, the more eyes on any 
any stream, the better. Um, I just have like, I'm so sorry, um, a technical question in regards to the app. Um, so I like scan the QR code with my phone and it's just like not doing anything or connecting in any way. Is that just like try again tomorrow or is there a specific thing that should be getting, should be happening? Sure, yeah. So, so when you scan the QR code, do you, are you just using your phone's like camera? No, I downloaded the, um, the ARCGIS one, two, three. And so I've scanned the QR code in the app. Oh, in the app. Okay. Um, well, I know for, for one way, and Ariel, feel free to jump in here, but one easy way to scan the QR code, and I probably sh I should have mentioned this, is to just put your camera, your phone's camera over it, and then a little message will pop up um, with a link, and that link will then bring you to that um, survey browser site where it tells you whether or not you can access a survey through the browser or access the survey through the one through three app. So I would recommend trying it that way, giving it a try, just scanning um, it with your phone's camera. Don't press anything, like don't take a picture of it, just hold it over, <laughs> they hold the camera over the QR code and that link should automatically pop up. I mean, it's being read by the app, it's just not doing anything. Like I'm just getting three bars that are constantly vibrating. Um, okay, I I'm, not, issue, I'm not sure what what that is, but um, but yeah, it's tricky because you can't really. Um, I wonder why that's doing that. And it could just be my computer. It could be too. I don't know if this is a system. I could. I don't know if the system is overloaded a bit right now, but um, yeah, I just get it through my my QR code reader as well, and it's doing the same. Like it sends me to like survey dot one two three dot arcus dot com blah, 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 URL, and it just won't load. I'm having the same issue. I've tried it a couple times during the meeting here. Where is the QR code again? Oh, uh, I tried, so, it's not working, but that was a while ago. So I don't know what the thing is doing. Okay, well, we'll go back and yeah, we'll definitely look at that and get that updated for you guys. Um, the QR code is on the site. So if you go to uh, ctuck.org, the Long Island Volunteer River Herring and Eel Survey um, page, the QR code and the link will also be there. Um, let me see, I'm not sure if Ariel's jumped out to maybe take a look at why that's happening. But um, link on yeah, the so I'm going through it now to try to figure out what the issue might be. Okay. So we'll get everyone some up-to-date info on, you know, why you might be having problems on that or, you know, a better way to, um, to access that. So, so we'll, be in, we'll definitely be in touch on that. Cool. Um, and there'll be like general direction from you all about when to start doing the surveys? Yes, yeah. So as we mentioned, um, I will add everyone who provided their email to um, to get into this webinar, as well as anyone who kind of uses our uh, participant info sheet. Um, I will uh, add you guys all to our River Herring listserv. Basically, it's a bi biweekly email that I send out to all the volunteers across Long Island to update everyone on when you should start going out, you know, as weather changes, what we're seeing through the survey season, is it a high time, is it a low time, um, I will give everyone updates on that. So, and if you don't want to be added to the listserv, that's fine, you could just email me and let me know. Um, but we'll also be updating all this info on the Long Island uh, River Herring Survey Facebook group as well. So if you prefer, you know, to get your info one way or the other, or if you prefer to do both, that's great too. Um, so that's where we provide all the info on kind of when to start, when we see the first river herring, when we see the last, all that stuff will be provided through the um, email listserv and through uh, the Facebook group. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much. This is like really well thought out and highly technological. I'm very impressed. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Hopefully thank we can you. just get the survey one, two, three to cooperate and everything will be good. <laughs> I have a feeling it might be just like a system overload. Okay. Because I went through the link and I did the QR code and I also tested this prior to this webinar and it worked okay. 
So maybe, maybe after people aren't trying to get to it at once, we'll yeah. see. But um, we'll be in touch. Yeah, if there's any issues, we can also follow up with any updates. Yeah, so maybe um, for now, if you want to give it a try in the next couple of days, and if you're still having problems, feel free to email us. Again, my email's in the chat, Ariel's email's in the chat, um, and we'll we'll help you through that. And um, and like I said, through through the email, through the Facebook group, I'll, I'll providing updates on there too. So if we're still having issues or if anything's going off with the survey, we will update everyone through those mediums. So tomorrow's headline is going to be citizen scientists crash Esri servers. Is that, <laughs> is that it? Yes. I guess so. <laughs> Excellent. That's that's a good headline. That's what we do best. <laughs> Enrico, a quick yeah. question. Does Wertheim monitor Yapan Creek or uh, Little Neck Run in uh, in the in Wertheim? No, I don't. I I I think they they stop by once in a while but no i don't think there's anybody regularly watching Is there any that possibility site. of cooperating with them you know and giving access to someone in there you know and one person they, they won't allow a lot of people in there yeah no that's a good idea it's that's yeah i'll uh i can reach out to them about it sure. we know the fish are in the commons and you know and, and that's a that's a marvelous site i don't know if you saw the the natural fish passage that they made across the railroad tracks to the, yeah it's beautiful that is really beautiful yep so, yeah it's a good idea Maybe yeah, if you we'll, find out some info, and I'd be, be willing to go there. Okay, I'll uh, I'll find out. Okay, so are there any last minute questions before I think we're probably going to wrap up? Okay, great. Um, well, thank you. Oh, did I see? Was there a last question? Okay. Um. So yeah. So. Thank you everyone for coming so much. Um, as I mentioned, if you have any additional questions or if things just weren't quite clear, or if you're just not quite sure how to do some of this stuff, please feel free to email us. We'd be happy to walk you through anything. Um, again, in the chat right now is the protocol sheet, um, the South Shore guide, and the participant info form. So if you want to download some of the documents and fill out the form, that'd be great. We are all, so if you can't for some reason, no worries. We are also going to send all those documents and info out via the email list and the Facebook group later on. Um, so you'll get that info that way as well. And again, we have another regional training next week on March 4th. Um, if you're interested in kind of just getting another overview, like I said, it'll be all the same information, um, but you're welcome to be there if you'd like. Um, and yeah, I think that's all the points I wanted to make. Um, Ariel or Enrico, is there any last minute takeaways or thoughts? Just thanks to everybody for their interest. It's this whole this whole survey and all the river herring uh, restoration work over the past 15 years is built on volunteers finding these fish. So we're happy to have you involved. And I just want to drop a little reminder that next month is the third installment of Community Science LI. So we will be presenting on bats on Long Island. So it's going to be super interesting. Emily and myself will be there again. Um, that is, like I said, March 22nd from three to four. I will drop the link to register for the future webinars in the chat. Um, and you can register there and look out for all the other scheduled webinars coming up. All right. Well, thank you everyone again. And um, like I said, if you need to get in touch with us, our emails are in the chat and you can just go on ctech.org and find our emails that way too. But feel free to reach out to us. Um, yeah. And everyone have a great night. Thank you so much again for joining and um, happy surveying. <laughs> have a good night. Thank everyone. You well. good thank night. you.